Hey everyone, Jarek here, and I really like Half-Life. If you watch this channel, you probably really like Half-Life as well. It's a cornerstone to this channel. So much so that I cover every single Half-Life that comes out. Half-Life being exactly what you think it would be. A game incredibly inspired by Half-Life. My favorite thing about this subgenre is that no Half-Life is alike, even though they all run on the same formula. Industria plays nothing like a DACA and Adaka plays nothing like Kvark, the focus of today's video. At least I think it's pronounced Kvark. I could be butchering that entirely. I don't know, someone will correct me in the comments. You might be wondering why I'm in a post-Soviet bunker. Well, it's because this game takes place in a post-Soviet Czech Republic, a fictional version of it in the 80s. Kvark's location and its gameplay makes it stand out from other Half-Lifes. It feels more like Half-Life 1, whereas games like Industria and Adaka take after Half-Life 2. And I am more than okay with this. I love Half-Life 1's cramped corridors. I love Half-Life 1's gameplay. Don't get me wrong, Half-Life 2 is good, but I prefer Half-Life 1 a bit more. I wouldn't blame you if you don't believe me that this is a Half-Life. I mean, this looks more like Herat, but I promise you it plays like if Herat wanted to be Half-Life. I mean, hell, they directly lifted some levels from Half-Life 1. Notably, on a rail and residue processing. I'm not sure why they lifted the two worst chapters out of Half-Life 1, even possibly worse than Zen, but they did. More surprisingly, these chapters are actually some of the best in this game. The on a rail chapter specifically is really fun. The rail car is nowhere near as annoying to use as it is in Half-Life 1. You don't get electrified by the rails. It doesn't hinder your movement. When you get off of the cart, it's because there's an actual arena or a puzzle you need to solve. It's like they took the good premise from Half-Life 1 and turned it into a proper linear vehicle section. It is quite good. Residue processing is pretty short, but has a unique gimmick. Here you need to help a machine build a robot so it can open a door so you can actually get to the platformy bits. And the platformy bits are really short so they don't overstay their welcome. It's amusing because Kvart claims that it's inspired by games like Doom and Quake and the 90s classics, but it's very clearly more inspired by Half-Life. Which I guess is a 90s classic, but you know what people mean when they say Doom and Quake in 90s classics. They're not really talking about Half-Life there. But before I can get into any more detail, let's talk about this game's release. As of right now, it is only on PC. But as a PC release, it's pretty good. Every setting I expected was here, yes, including an FOV slider. I didn't have a single crash, and most importantly, it ran smoothly without stuttering at a high frame rate. Now, the game goes for an old retro look, so that may not seem very impressive until you realize it runs on Unreal Engine 5, which seems to be giving everyone trouble. Yet this game ran flawlessly. Not only does it look good for the retro style it's trying to pull off, but it sounds really good. This was the part that I was genuinely impressed by. Yeah, we've seen a million retro games at this point, so nailing the retro look maybe isn't the best thing you've ever seen. I'm more impressed that Unreal Engine 5 isn't giving them trouble. That said, I love it when someone gets audio right, and this game's audio sounds so nice, specifically the guns. Yes, any gun can have a nice sound to it. I don't think that's as impressive, although it is satisfying. It's the fact that the guns reverberate through the tunnels you're going through. If you fire a gun in a bunker, it is going to echo, and that part is going to pull you out of the immersion if it doesn't. If it's a flat sounding gun, then you're clearly playing a video game. The music is also really good. It fits whatever is currently happening in the game, whether it's a slow downtime, or it's in the middle of combat. The one criticism I have here is that the music never really stops. It is always playing. For a game trying to be this atmospheric, it would be nice to just have a bit of quiet, listening to the ambience of the background of the bunkers. I think the world here is built good enough to where music isn't needed to pull you in. Okay, what's actually happening here? I've talked a lot, but I haven't explained why you're in this bunker. Well, this game starts off with an opening cutscene that has so much personality. I loved watching it. Okay, 
dopředu. Náplní vaší práce bude těžba a manipulace s uranovou rudou. Možná se ptáte, není taková práce nebezpečná? Ano, je. I nejproduktivnější vás můžeme vybrat, abyste se zúčastnili celé... Dobré zprávy, díky naší tvrdé práci se daří ten plán na 150%. Díky tomu můžeme zvýšit potravy na příděly na 200 gramů. Tento týden zemřelo při práci pouze 5 zaměstnanci. Děkujeme za jejich tvrdou práci a navidenou při dalším týdenním hlášení. Yeah, so you work for a nuclear power plant slash mines in the Czech Republic. Except for their working conditions are quite literally slavery. To make things even worse, you wake up in a jail cell, treating their workers right as always. From this point on, it's survival. Trying to escape this power plant, trying to get out of the mines with your life, while piecing together what the hell happened. Surely there weren't mutants when you were working at this place. Why are there mutants here now? Actually, there might have been. If you read some of these logs, they get pretty ridiculous. You'll get another cutscene at the beginning of episode 2 that shows off what these working conditions are like in a quite humorous way. Dávejte však pozor. V tomto oddělení se nachází a testují výdobytky naší společnosti tzv. roboti. Když na nějakého takového tzv. robota narazíte, zachovejte klid. Tyto plechové krabice jsou totiž nadmíru nebezpečné. Pokud se však budete řídit podle protokolu, nic se vám nemůže stát. Nedělejte rychlé pohyby a pomalu se vzdalte do bezpečné vzdálenosti 750 metrů. You truly will not really know what's going on in this game, but I say that in a good way. I say that in a way that leaves mystery around you in this place. You want to figure it out and you want to explore. And that leads to some good old fashioned linear Half-Life style gameplay. The pacing in this game is fantastic because it follows what Half-Life did whether they meant to or not. Half-Life had this idea where they would give you 15 minutes of combat, then five minutes of downtime to explore the environment. This makes Half-Life feel like a chill game despite the fact that the contents in it are anything but chill. It's because it allows the player to go at their own pace. This is the same reason why it feels like Half-Life is less linear than it really is. And this game takes that same approach. It even takes the same approach of pretty much everything around you being a gray hallway. But Half-Life pulled this off, and I think this game did too. There's a lot of little details in this world, stuff for you to find, notes left by previous employees. Yes, the entire game may be industrial in gray, but there's enough personality in these gray hallways to make everything not look the same. It wasn't something I even thought about until I beat the game. And some places do have a bit of a post-Soviet flair, so that probably helps make it look a little distinct. But okay, enough rambling. How's the combat? That's probably what you care about. Well, you know those guns I mentioned that sounded loud and powerful? Well, they feel pretty powerful too. This game has the same sort of retro jibbing that old games do, and this will always make me giggle. You have a nice roster of weapons that, albeit aren't exactly very innovative, but they do their job well. You have your basic pistol, which is fairly accurate and good at getting headshots. You will use this throughout the entire game. The AK takes the place of your standard starting automatic. You get a powerful pump action shotgun that will always be useful. You get a double barrel shotgun that should be awesome, but it confuses me because you can't fire both barrels at once. So then I have to ask, What's the point of having both a regular pump action and a double barrel? They serve the same function. The double barrel doesn't do more damage than the regular pump action and they use the same ammo. I actually thought something was wrong with the game, like there was a bug, maybe the split fire button wasn't working, I don't know. I restarted the game at one point and no, you just can't fire both barrels at once. I think the dev also realized that these guns now become redundant, so in episode 2 you get all of your weapons taken away get the double barrel back, and never get the regular pump action. Regular enemies drop it, but you can't pick it up. That's fine. The only real function you would have had is swapping back and forth between them to maximize your damage output, but this isn't that kind of game and you'd never need to do that. It's not even really optimal here. You get your standard bolt action, which serves as a proper sniper rifle. It's pretty darn good. It pops heads, although when you aim down sights, your right hand just disappears. Not really sure where this happens. This is a little weird. Maybe it's a holdover from the early access release? Oh right, I forgot to mention, in the early access release when the game first came out, you didn't have hands, you were just a floating gun. They since have added proper reloading animations and proper hands, and to me this looks a lot better. It's not a game ruiner if you don't have any hands, I mean you don't have hands in a DACA and I love that game too. 
but I do think it helps. You get a crossbow, which honestly kind of sucks. The bolts travel really slowly, have a really big arc. If you flinch, you'll miss your target. If you're not aiming down the scope, it's incredibly inaccurate, even in their face. It will only really be useful if you get headshots. It doesn't do enough damage to the body. I think this thing could use some buffs. One shot to the upper body is not crazy to ask for on weaker enemies. Then one of the more interesting weapons is an electric PPSH. Yeah, you heard that right, an electric PPSH. It doesn't function at all like a PPSH. It's, it's not a bullet hose, it just is a taser. You'll find chargers on the wall that you can charge your gun with, which is a sentence I never thought I would say. But it really does function as a taser. If you charge it up and shoot at an enemy, you will stun them for a certain amount of time. It can be useful, but more often than not, I found just shooting the enemies without bothering was a better solution. And then you get the grenades, which surprisingly you don't get them till like 60% of the way through the game. I would have liked them sooner. When I first picked them up, I actually thought they sucked. You charge up your throw to throw it farther and then they bounce all over the place and it's just hard to land them at the feet of your opponent. You can't cook these grenades either. So I really didn't think they were useful until I realized they're contact grenades and then I immediately thought they were the best thing ever. Contact grenades are incredibly useful in about every game. Do I need to remind you of Fear's grenades? They're pretty darn strong and being able to charge up the grenade throw makes it a lot easier to nail opponents in the face. So those are your weapons. How about the enemies? Well, there's a decent amount of enemy variety. It starts with a basic enemy like a rat, or I should say a mutated rat. Yeah, these things just kind of run straight at you. They're honestly a little annoying, but you can get rid of them with the pistol pretty quick. I don't complain too loud because they do have personality at least. Then you get the real base enemies. An enemy in a hazmat suit that's trying to melee you, and an enemy in a hazmat suit that has a pistol. The guys with the pistols are way more of a threat. They're pretty darn accurate. Oftentimes the melee enemies will just block your shots because they're running straight at you, so you gotta try to get rid of the stupid guys with the pistols. Then you have these drones, which I feel are inspired by Portal, but feel unique in their own way. And at the end of episode one, you get this final boss, a rat god. This boss is a little generic, but honestly, it's fine. It has numerous phases between charging at you, throwing things at you, sending rats out to try to kill you. You know how much health it has left. Like I said, it's a bit basic for what it is, but I really don't have any real complaints. It works. Episode one is a really good proof of concept. You can see what this game is. You can see what it's aspiring to be. You can see that the dev is improving, and that becomes very apparent with episode 2. Episode 2 is so much better than episode 1 in both pacing and variety. None of these things were particularly bad in episode 1, but you definitely had ways to improve. You get a few new enemies in episode 2. The two big ones are the shotgunners and the spiders. The shotgunners are huge. Yes, you had melee enemies charging at you before, but the shotgunners are way more of a threat. They are priority number one to get rid of. As for the spiders, they're a big deal just for atmosphere. While episode one was mostly dark gray corridors in this power facility, episode two goes full on horror mode at times. You're in dark spider infested mines. Now with all these spiders everywhere, I thought it was leading up to some big spider boss or something unimaginative. Hell, I even found a spider statue. I think this is supposed to be some sort of an Easter egg, but no, a spider boss is not what I got at all. Instead, the final boss for episode two is an excavator. It's just this big machine. And this doesn't come out of nowhere. You find notes talking about how the machine keeps spinning on its own, and they know it's not the workers causing the problem because the workers keep getting shot whenever this problem pops up, as is the classic Soviet way. You have a problem, you just kill a guy. This is one of the more interesting bosses I have ever seen in a game. It has weak spots that'll pop up that you need to shoot while it spins around. It will start firing missiles out of the top of the excavator, and it will send out robots to try to kill you. It'll spin around in two different locations, further out or further in. This is totally random, so you can't predict it, you have to react to it. This boss has three distinct chunks of health, and the boss changes with each chunk of health taken away. The one complaint I have about this boss is that it can instantly kill you, and I generally hate it when things instantly kill me. In this case, I'm not really sure what to do, because this looks like it should instantly kill you. The problem is on the third chunk of health, it spins very quickly, giving you very little time to react, and you're gonna have to do the whole boss battle all over again. Yeah, it's a little annoying for what is otherwise a really good, unique boss. But that leads me to some of the complaints I do have about this game. The first one is that enemies don't flinch very much. Mainly the pistol enemies. 
Those guys will shoot you through your own bullets like it's Call of Duty. They definitely need a cooldown. When they get shot, they shouldn't be allowed to shoot right back at you for a second. But my next complaint is a way bigger deal. The way combat works in this game is that more often than not, you would walk into a room, every enemy would immediately see you and then start bum rushing you. Of course, the best response to this is to back up into the hallway that you came in from. There's only one hallway into these arenas where enemies are, so the result is that you don't use the arena, you just funnel them into that hallway. There's no other ways to get into that arena to flank them. I just played defensively, backed up and shot them as they blindly ran in. There's two reasons this happens. The first one is the map design. Since there's only one way into this arena, they only have one way to go and you only have one way to go. Thus, you're going to take the easiest way to get rid of them, bottlenecking them into the hallway. The next problem is that the AI, while not being egregiously stupid, does just run straight at you. You have literally no reason to go into the arena if they're going to do that. The developer caught onto this and started improving it in episode two. They had two main solutions. The first one was a defense section, which is, I don't know, kind of a boring way to fix it. None of the defense sections were egregiously bad or even bad at all, they were fine, just, it's not very interesting. The other way they fixed it is the classic Valve way of fixing things by going into a room, having three different switches or something you have to do in offshoots in different rooms, which then naturally leads into combat encounters. And then there's the third way of fixing it where the map design just got better over time. I really can't stress how much better episode two is over episode one. The last thing I will mention is the perk system. This is pretty simple, don't panic. You will find syringes in the game full of anethium. This is effectively in-game currency to level up your perks. These are all really simple. There's not really a whole lot that needs to be said. One of them may increase your headshot damage. Another one may make you sprint slower, but also take less damage. They're all simple stuff like that. With the exception of one that I found really interesting. This one gave you a 20% chance to heal from killing enemies at the cost of 15 less max health and 15% less health from pickups. These are the kind of perks I love seeing in games because they genuinely change how you play the game. This is now like a blend between Half-Life and Doom. You have to play more aggressively with these mechanics. The other ones are all just passive buffs and really aren't that interesting. It's nice that they're there to deal with enemies getting stronger throughout the game, but again, not interesting. So there's Kvark. How do I feel about this game? Well, you guys know me, you know I like Half-Life a lot, and I will take any Half-Life I can get. However, I won't pass a bad Half-Life off just because it's a Half-Life. Thankfully, this is not bad. It shows a lot of promise and is quite unique. I also would love to see more Half-Life 1 style Half-Lifes instead of Half-Life 2 style Half-Lifes. I've heard numerous people argue that Half-Life 1 is really a boomer shooter and I can't disagree any harder. Half-Life 1 feels very different from games like Quake and Doom. Kvark is also pretty cheap so I would highly recommend it. Go give it a try. Hey, huge thanks to my channel members. They get to watch my videos at minimum a week early, as soon as I have them done, really. So hey, if you want to get early access, consider joining. Thank all you guys for watching this video. Dragon, we'll see you next time.